My view is everything is marketing and marketing is everything. So a developer dealing with a tradesperson, a developer dealing with council, a developer dealing with irate neighbours, everything you do in the context of those scenarios is marketing. You are listening to the Property Developer Podcast, your home for tips, ideas and inspiration to help take your developing to the next level. Now here's your host, Justin Getty. Hello and welcome to episode 39 of the show. Thanks for joining me. I trust you are well and your projects are moving along nicely. Today on the show, we are going to be talking marketing with one of Australia's leading small business marketing advisors. I'm sure you will get plenty of value and ideas from the discussion we have. Before we get to that, here's an update on what I've been up to. In the last episode, I mentioned that we had been to our tribunal hearing and were waiting on a decision. Well, we have received the ruling from the planning tribunal following our appeal against council's decision not to grant us a permit. So, the tribunal decided, insert drum roll, to uphold the council's decision, which means we lost. The tribunal member decided that our proposal was too big compared with the footprints of the neighboring properties. Our design didn't match the neighborhood character of the area and there was insufficient, meaningful landscaping, amongst a host of other small reasons. It is obviously very disappointing to lose, as we felt we had a strong case given the location and zoning, but the tribunal felt otherwise. So we have to take the decision on the chin and move on. It certainly was an experience going to the tribunal, and I learnt a lot from it. Some of the key lessons I learnt are, one, First and foremost, the risk of confirmation bias. I was confident that what we had proposed was acceptable for the location, given the planning controls and strategic policy of the local council, and this was shared by all the consultants we engaged to advise us. They all believed what we had put forward was acceptable, and because it aligned with my own thinking, it strengthened my own belief. However, we were all wrong, but I am the one without the chair once the music stopped. I remember reading about how Jeff Bezos, the head of Amazon, also appreciates the risk of confirmation bias and forces the company to challenge its assertions and ideas to ensure they really are robust and not just nice ideas that lots of people like. And it goes back to the adage of there being nobody who cares more about the project succeeding than you. So be aware of the risk of people telling you what you want to hear. The second lesson is about the significant impact a tribunal loss has on the momentum and timing of your business. We have essentially wasted 18 months getting to this point. This is time we cannot get back. We are basically back at square one looking at another 12 months minimum before we get a planning outcome, which is pretty frustrating given how long it takes to bring a project to market and get it finished. This lost time leaves a hole in my future pipeline of works. The key lesson to be learned from this is the importance of having multiple projects at different stages so that a setback in one project doesn't derail your ability to consistently be progressing your business. The third lesson is around appreciating the risk associated with property developing. In this case, I underestimated the planning risk of not achieving a permit. I did identify it as a risk when I was planning the project, but I felt our mitigation strategy would be to go to VCAT and succeed there. Obviously that didn't work, so next time I may have to rein back my expectations on what is possible from a design perspective. There are many more lessons that I learnt, but those are probably the big three. As I mentioned, it is very frustrating to lose, but we have to cop it on the chin and move on. Fortunately, the market surged during our holding period, so the land has gone up in value, so we aren't facing the prospect of losing money on the project. But we have to decide whether we sell up and realise our profits early, or start again with a new planning application. I will let you know which way we decide to go. Okay, on with the show. My guest today is Tim Reid, one of Australia's leading advisors and commentators on small business marketing. Sales and marketing of a project is such a crucial piece that I wanted to speak with Tim about how property developers can take their marketing to the next level. Tim is the host of a great podcast called The Small Business Big Marketing Show, which you can find on the iTunes store. He is also the author of the book, The Boomerang Effect, and his website at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com 
is chock full of helpful ways that you can grow your business through marketing. In this discussion, Tim and I cover some essential areas you should use in your marketing, one thing that will help you stand out in a crowded marketplace, and why some people fail at marketing. I started off by asking Tim what food he would eat until he was sick, and his answer was a little surprising. Donuts. Hot cinnamon donuts. It's all you need. Just the plain ones? Yeah, yeah. Don't complicate it with icing or jam or anything. Uh, it brings it triggers some childhood stuff because I we used to go to a family holiday down uh, on the coast and there was a place, me golf place next door that would smash them out. And when you're cooking a hot cinnamon donut, the smell kind of drifts. So, great question. Uh, now I'm going to find a segue into property development, <laughs> <laughs> which is um, I actually have a view. I mean. I actually said to my boys, my two teenage boys, Jack and Will, we talk about, you know, what business would you have? It's just kind of a, a topic for car trips. And I reckon, I honestly believe there is an opportunity for someone to open up a hot cinnamon donut shop. No jam, no icing, no drinks. I, I just, like, why hasn't someone done it? Well, they've got pretty fancy for a while. I know. Donuts. Complicated. Yeah. Donut time and all these, you know, crispy creams. No, no. Well, they're like seven or eight bucks a donut now, which seems a bit ridiculous. It's unreal, isn't it? So there you go. Property developers <laughs> listening. That's what I'd be doing. None of these unit developments. Oh, uh, well, I guess there's uh, there's no holes in property developing. Maybe that's a segue for you. But there's holes in donuts. <laughs> nice. Hey, okay. we done? Oh, well, how about we just roll into it, <laughs> into the interview? <laughs> Now, Tim, we're here to talk today with you about marketing, and you're one of Australia's premier small business marketing advisors. Wow. We've been called a marketing wanker before, but advisor, I'll take that. Well, we'll probably use advisor (laughs) throughout the show, depending (laughs) on how it goes. Correct. (laughs) Correct. Uh, And you run Australia's number one... Yeah, marketing podcast. Yes, probably the first in Australia. Yeah, About, it's almost nine years old. The small business big marketing show. Actually, now that you bring it up, it was actually the inspiration for me choosing to heavily invest in my own marketing in my projects. Good, and the inspiration for me starting this podcast. I'm on it. So thank you. Oh, my pleasure. It's great that you've. Uh, you know, I hear that a lot, and my my response is one is two things. Thank you. I feel very honoured by that, but I also you're one of the few who have actually taken action because most people listening to this show will go, they'll either go, he's like, he's a dickhead or uh, I liked what he had to say. He had some good marketing ideas and they don't implement anything. They don't take action. Uh, and, you know, we'll, there is no doubt we'll cover some good marketing ground today. Uh, but it's just air unless you do something about it, right? So well done to you for, for actually implementing that's okay. Thank you. We're going to talk about what things people can do out there, but let's start off by finding out why you are the doyen of small business marketing. <laughs> well, I did a, um, I've always had a real passion for small business and I never knew why. I worked in corporate marketing for 20 years, looking after some really big brands, Gillette, Uncle Toby's, Mercedes-Benz in an advertising context. Um, I would talk to a small business owner about marketing during my time in corporate, and they were very, very interested. They were attentive, and they would take action, and I liked that. They didn't want to meet. They just wanted to go, what do I do? How do I do it? See you later. And that was good, because that didn't happen in corporate. You had to have meetings, right? So, and then one day, I did a look into my family tree, just having a look around, and I realized there was no small business owners anywhere in sight. Everyone was uh, an employee. For, for a long way back. And I thought, that's interesting. Uh, and I have, and then at that point, I started my own business, which was a marketing consultancy. And I wanted to be one of them, the, one of the small business owners. And off the back of that, I started a podcast to differentiate, differentiate myself from all the other marketers out there. And that is the Small Business Big Marketing Show. And it took over, and here we are. Fantastic. It's a long answer to a pretty short question. Well, it's interesting because the property development industry as a whole and property developers quite often are solopreneurs or yes. small business owners. And then a guest I once had on the show described the building and construction industry as a large cottage industry. Sure. Because it's made up of all these independent 
contractors who subcontract to other people. So a lot of them out there are small business owners. And probably more and more so these days, you know, crowded marketplace. Yeah. And so for developers, they're a small business and they rely on other people to help them get the Mm -hmm. projects done. And obviously marketing and selling sales and marketing is a big part of that. And I think a lot of the time they just outsource that or delegate that to Mm -hmm. real estate agents. But I don't think they necessarily Mm -hmm. need to. So I'm sure in your dealings with small business owners, you get a lot of, I don't have time to do that or I don't know how to do that. Is that, would that does that happen? Oh, there is not enough respect for marketing. So you talk about developers going to real estate agents, but there's that, that, that's the component of selling the development, right? But my view is everything is marketing and marketing is everything. So a developer dealing with a tradesperson, a developer dealing with council, a developer dealing with irate, neighbours, you know, everything you do in the context of those scenarios is marketing, how you present yourself. I did a blog today on voicemail greetings because I think they're average. It's marketing. It's you putting yourself out there in front of a potential client, supplier, media person, someone who has the ability to impact positively or negatively on your business. So I think if we look at marketing as a pie chart, um, advertising, brochures, website is a small component, is a slice of that pie chart. But it's everything else that you do. It's your branding, it's your logo, it's your it's your voicemail greeting. Don't get me started. Um, it's the way you handle yourself at a meeting. It's it's everything. And if you can get your mind around that, and then go, okay, if everything I do in my business is marketing, then what? How do I convey that? What is my brand about? What's the personality of my brand? How do I want people to talk about my brand? And then make and these are all called touch points, right? And then make sure that you are consistent throughout every every transaction and every piece of dialogue you have in your business. So right now you've got people scared that there's all this stuff that they're supposed yeah. to look at, sit yes. down, write it out. Is that is that the case? Uh, I, I, scared's interesting because I, I kind of pride myself on being the guy that um, demystifies marketing. But you can't demystify something if, unless you acknowledge that it's scary or complicated, right? So um, whilst it might be scary and alien, um, it should also be fun. Because I, in, on the Small Business Big Marketing Show, I have interviewed as of today 393 successful business owners. And one, and there's a number of things that link them, but one of them is their respect for marketing, and one of them is the fact that they view marketing as a hobby. And and I like that. No one's ever said, "Oh, marketing's a hobby." But my kind of the way I've kind of packaged that up is that yeah, they, the ones who who are successful, they love marketing. And when something's a hobby, you'll find time for it. You'll find a few bucks to throw at it. You'll you can't wait to do it again. So all of a sudden, if you as a, as a developer can get to the point where the marketing of whatever you're doing, yourself, your business, your people, your ideas, your concepts is a hobby, then that's a good place to get to. Because what it means is uh, you're not going to watch that next series of Game of Thrones. You know, you, because that's what people do. They go and binge watch something on Netflix or they, they, they procrastinate in order not to address something much more important. So... You know, uh, find more time. Make it a hobby. Not, it's not. Their accountants. You're, I'm sure your accountant views marketing as an expense, which you can. You can claim it. I get that in, in its kind of um, in its terminology. But uh, marketing is absolutely an investment in, in whatever you're doing. Well, every time my accountant sends me his monthly newsletter, I know that he doesn't invest too heavily in his account in his marketing <laughs> because it's his newsletter in the, in the subject line. Yeah, yeah. Oh, at least you know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> and every time I think, you could do better than that. Well, yeah, yeah, you could. Well, how do you move from uh, making it a hobby? From well, you know, into making it a hobby, you mean? Well, how do you go from knowing that you should probably invest some time and effort into it to it's a hobby, I love doing it, I enjoy it, it's not a problem, it's not a hassle? Uh, that, that'll happen because you start to see results. Like if you... If you, leave every, if you leave your marketing to chance 
or if you leave your marketing to someone else, which is not a bad idea, I mean, I don't, you know, we can't be good at everything. So you kind of got to your cash flow allowing, outsource things, um, give give other people the responsibility of doing things. But start to do something. Uh, like we are talking before we hit record about the fact that um, I said to you when you started the podcast, um, like, don't look at the scoreboard for six months. You've decided podcasting is your thing. It's going to be a way to build your brand and whatever else comes from it. So for the next six months, create a piece, of, create a great piece of content once a week and don't look at if you're getting emails or shares or if web traffic traffic's increasing because you'll be disappointed and you'll stop doing it because some of this stuff takes some time to get traction. But over the end, but now you said you've been getting emails, you're meeting new people, there's people that you've introduced to that you never thought you would have the opportunity to have a one on one with. And that's when you go, oh, hang on, there's something happening here. Because what I also find, my particular view on marketing is that you should be helpful in your marketing. If you do anything, be helpful. Identify all the problems that your customers, clients, prospects have and go about answering them in your marketing. And if you do that, what happens is your marketing produces multiples. It returns multiples. I call this the boomerang effect, which is when you set out to do some marketing and you hope it gets some inquiry. You hope it generates inquiry, and it will. Good marketing will generate inquiry that will lead to the sales process that allows you to close deals. But good marketing also leads to other things, and I can't say what that is for you or anyone listening. For me, it's been... um, It's allowed me to close, my podcast has allowed me to close my consulting business, get sponsors on board. It created an entire international speaking business where I got to speak at conferences all around the world. Um, I now do radio. Um, It's just opened up things that I never, ever expected uh, because I was helpful in my marketing and I was consistent with it. Yeah, I think that's a good point about trying to be helpful and to be considerate of who your audience is. Sure. Because I think a lot of developers, and the, the, particularly with the websites that I see, they don't seem to have that consideration for who's looking at their content. Mm-hmm. And they'll plug stuff in stories that actually I don't think would be relevant to someone who might be looking to buy. That particular development. That, yeah, so yeah. they might put something up, some industry news, for example. Yeah. which does my head in. Which is, isn't really of uh, interest to who your audience is. None. Whereas you might be able to put up some content that helps them make a buying decision. So if, they're moving, if they're moving into an apartment, how can you choose smaller furniture, things like that. Is that would that be Great. an avenue you go down? Anything that you can do as the developer to make people make a more informed purchase decision, often in your favour, because what will happen is in creating helpful marketing, you are going to build trust with people. Oh, this, this developer's really good. They're helping me make decisions around um, how to furnish small rooms. They're helping me make decisions around landscaping because... The developers created marketing like that, as opposed to brochure stuff, which is generally nothing with brochures, but factual stuff, you know, just identifying the key, um, I don't know what your terminology is, but the key components of a, of a building within the development. Yeah, that's interesting, but help me along the way, because what happens when I mean, you're about to embark on a, a development and um, people will have questions about different aspects of it. Let's say there is a question around... Um, you know, for me, like, I'm not colorblind, but I may as well be because I have no idea how to match walls with floors with benches and everything in between. And socks with belts. From- socks with belts. Absolutely right. Got no idea with it. Have you ever, do you know what to do there? Do you match your socks to your belt or your shoes? Yeah, no, I think it's the shoes. See, I don't know. Yeah. We digress. But my, my, my point, <laughs> I always love that one, is that if you've got a prospect say, at um, an open uh, or even before that at some kind of, what do you have, a pre-release? Yeah, often of, you're selling co- off the plan. As right, well. right. So you're selling, selling plan, an idea. pre-release, cocktail party, you're swanning around. If there's a prospect there who has a question around colours or whatever, and you can say, listen, give us your email address. I'm going to flick you a video or a blog post or a podcast episode that I've created that actually answers your question in quite some detail, they're going to love you. They're going to go, wow, how helpful is this developer? They care. They're, they're empathetic. They already know a question that I have and they've gone about answering it. That's very powerful. Yeah, I agree. So I think 
websites are a good place to start if you're a developer out there. Sure. Get one to start with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I reckon. Uh, and then start focusing on content that can help buyers make a decision. Sure. That's yep. what I would think. What's your view? Yeah, well, I think a website's easy. Uh, you know, in terms of, it doesn't have to be complicated. It should be updated regularly. It should have some interactive nature about it. If I was doing a development and I thought I'm going to need to get a website, um, home page, overview, video, introducing the, the idea, the concept, maybe the developer if that's important to the, to the buyers. Um, I would have a knowledge centre. I call it a knowledge centre or a, whatever you want to call it. But it's basically, it's more than an FAQ section. It's like a library of every question you could potentially or have been asked and you go about answering it. One question, one really good answer per page, not a long page of 20 questions and answers, one question, one answer per page. That's incredibly valuable because that's when you can start grabbing links from that knowledge center and flicking it out to individuals. And Google will index that page very well too, as long as it's done in a, in a, in a way that is helpful and detailed. Um, I would introduce the team. I think you should put faces to names. I think too many service industries in particular um, don't personalise and human. I think people buy from people. I think property is the biggest decision you'll make. So the more trust and familiarity you can build with a prospect, the better. So introduce the team. Um, obviously have all the features and benefits of the development and, and all that. Um, you're starting to build a pretty good website. And make it really, really easy for people to contact you. It does my head in how many... I, this is, I go, restaurants are really bad at this. What's the one thing you would potentially like going to a restaurant's website? Address and phone number. Yeah? Often not there. Often. Like, <laughs> well, that's if they've got a website. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> so um, that, yeah, that, that's your website. And then view your website as the hub. Uh, it's like a hub and spoke kind of model where in the, the, the hub is the website and the spokes, if you like, are all pointing in to the website. So a spoke might be a podcast that the developer decides to do. It could be signage, it could be car wraps, it could be brochures, it could be social media activity. It could be whatever it is that all points back to the website. Because my view is, and particularly as a developer who probably potentially doesn't have a shop front or an office that people walk past or can go to, then the website, you are one step removed from at least calling or emailing that developer to inquire. Mm. And then what in terms of the spokes coming off the website, what... What spokes would they be? The social media? Yeah, so, like, like, yeah so social media, brochures, um, blog posts, podcasts, a YouTube channel, ads in the local paper, uh, a signage in an, in an agent's window. Anything out there that is going to generate interest, point them back to your website. And then what about emotional content or using emotion in your marketing. I know I try and make it emotional wherever I can or tap into people's emotions. Is that yes. something that's... I think it's critical. critical. It's absolutely critical. And we are emotional beings. So we, re we, would re react, we react to emotions. Uh, the opposite is being rational. And there's a time for rational. But I think emotion, and what we mean by that is um, storytelling, for example. You know... Uh, tell the story, if there's a story to be told about the location or the suburb or the architect or a particular stone that's being used for the bench tops, tell the story, right? Tell the story that it's from, that marble's from the same quarry that um, Michelangelo took, <laughs> whatever it is. Because all of a sudden, I'm, I'm sitting up paying attention, right? I mean, I know a guy in Melbourne who has a, who has a, uh, like a marble, stone business and he does go to these quarries outside of Florence it's, a tr it's true and he like up until recently he's like and I told him about this he goes that's a good he goes and visits them I was like take videos you know show that you're there do Facebook updates because that positions you as the expert so back to story back to emotion I think storytelling is really good I think great copy well written copy is really good using emotional type words that get people engaged. That doesn't, that doesn't mean be, being overly verbose or ridiculously colourful in the language that you use, but paint a picture. Again, you're selling, you guys are selling property, so 
It's interesting. It's sexy. It's expensive. It's a high. It's it's a high uh, value purchase decision. So all the more reason to sell the emotion. People buy dreams, you know. Well, that's what we're selling: mm. dreams and ideas at the start of the day, you and are. hope to deliver it at the end of the day. Yeah. So, and I, particularly with copy, I often see very functional yes. copywriting, particularly around real estate listings. Mm. It's very much there's two bathrooms, three bedrooms, two car parks, yeah, and stone bench tops, yeah, and that's so, quite so, often that's where it gets left. Yeah, that's good, and, and there's a role for it, but it does. It's kind of like there's almost a full stop after that. Whereas I think. You know, a little trick, we talk about sell benefits, not features. So if you're selling a feature like um, every every home in this development comes with um, installed ceiling, an installed Sonos system in the ceiling, that's factual, rational, using two words in the middle, which means that, three words, which means that you'll never miss another song uh, or you'll never, you miss your favorite song. So, or whatever you want to do, but then turn it into a benefit, right? As opposed to just stopping by listing the feature. Yeah, that's good advice. And that's something I've taken on board, Tim, from listening to your shows and always try to do that in my copywriting. Well, (laughs) that makes a difference though. There's things like open plan kitchens, which means you can entertain while you're Preparing a great meal. There you go. It's a, it's a little bit more exciting and interesting. It is. Yeah, yeah. And then you can talk about, you know, if you wanted to be, and again, you don't have to go over the top here, but, you, you know, while you're preparing that slow-cooked pulled pork with a Vietnamese slaw, you know, the one we all love, you know, and just just having fun there. Um, I, I don't think it's out of the question. I mean, as a developer, you're spending a lot, you've got a lot of dough going out, um, and sometimes we forget to spend dough where it'll make that little 1% difference, I would encourage developers to find a good copywriter. Because I think copy's hard. I think copy's really hard. And I think great copy's particularly hard. But great copy will lead a prospect on a trail of discovery to a point of inquiry, right? Which is, oh, should I going to call these guys? This is okay. I want to know more. Count me in. Great copy is, is, is underestimated. And that's why copywriters are like 200 to 300 bucks an hour. Yeah, I remember interviewing Ben Buxton, one of our previous guests who's also a marketer, and he said it's like leaving a little trail of cookies along the way for totally. people to just sort of pick up and keep, along, keep well, going along the yeah, journey. Yeah, like you want to know just how important copy is. There's a little trick for copywriters have that the, ne- the end of a paragraph must have a hook to encourage people to start reading the next paragraph. I mean... You and I are never going to think about that stuff, but that is a trick, you know, because the possibility is most people will stop at the first paragraph. It's boring. But a great copywriter will have a hook to get you to keep reading. And so what are any particular social channels that you think must have these days? I don't think there are any must-have social channels. I think social media is um, a bright, shiny object that is, is potentially a distraction, but I think it's amazing. <laughs> so, as a father of three teenagers, like I want to kill social media. I think it's. I actually think, and I, I won't rattle on about this because it's the wrong forum to do so. But I think it's stuffing up society uh, on a whole lot of levels. We're distracted. People are walking along the street, looking at a phone, and not looking up. We no longer talk to people face to face. That stuff. I'll put my marketer. <laughs> That's Tim the father. That's the father. <laughs> Tim the marketer. Yeah, I'll get off my horse, the high horse now, and put my marketer's hat on and go. It's incredible. Uh, we can have real-time conversations with our prospects. We can put a side of our business forward that some people might not see, behind-the-scenes stuff, you know, just human stuff that you wouldn't normally, you don't share on a website or wherever else. Uh, there are different social media channels that serve different purposes, uh, and it is pretty incredible. Um, and I get that, but I don't see too many businesses really nailing it. I see a lot of businesses stuff it up. I see a lot of businesses open a Facebook or an Instagram account, put three posts up, and then I go there in October, and the last post was in June. What, is that business closed? Where are they? What happened is my kind of reaction as a consumer. Um, I think that uh, if you are going to embrace it, and, and it's worthwhile looking at, no doubt, then understand that each channel has a different role. So um, Facebook and, and um, 
Gary Vaynerchuk, this crazy social media commentator, probably of the world. He's, you know, he's bearable in small doses, but he talks about each channel being different. Facebook's a party. Facebook is where people go to see who's with who, where they're at, what they're eating, what they're wearing. So have that kind of lighthearted party conversation on Facebook. Um, LinkedIn is a networking event. People go to LinkedIn to talk business, to network, to connect, to find introductions. So have a business conversation by all means. Um, uh, Pinterest and Instagram is where you glamify everything, where everything should look kind of tickety-boo because it's very visual. And Twitter's a cocktail party where you have these, well, not anymore because it's 280 characters, but where you used to have short, sharp bursts of conversation back and forth. Um, if, I was, if I was a developer, I really like Pinterest. Under, uh, it's a small user base relative to everything else, but it gives you the opportunity to create all these pin boards around different stories, the story of fabrics or the story of roof tiles or the stories of garden layouts. And within that, you can have a, a beautiful pin board of each of them. So that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Facebook makes a lot of sense because you could document the journey of the development through video, pictures, words, Facebook Lives. So, you know, back to your question, which is which one? Uh, Choose one that you're comfortable with because if you're comfortable with it, you're more inclined to continue to use it on a regular basis. And what about video? What's your view on video? Um, I'm an audio guy because I've been podcasting for nine years uh, I love audio because people can consume it in bed, at the gym, driving to work, walking the dog. They don't have to be looking at a screen. Uh, audio has poor conversion because because people are in bed or walking the dog or driving the car, and you ask them to do something like, "Oh, guys, can you just hit the you know hit the buy now button on the page over at blah?" They're not going to do it. They're just not and it, it frustrates the hell out of me, but I get it because I'm a big podcast listener and I don't do it either. Video, on the other hand, has you leaning into a screen where you can interact. You, you, have to, you can't be driving. You can't be doing anything else but watching that video. I think video has... There's, there's a role for both. Video is amazing because it's visual and it can be infinitely repurposed. Um, and it's a great way of showing stuff, you know, walkthroughs of different things and all that but uh so yeah and it's it's harder to produce you know you literally what are we sitting at your kitchen table you plug the microphone into a usb jack into your macbook and you hit record we're away now if we were doing video we'd have to worry about light we'd have to worry about framing we'd have to worry about audio you're then left with a really big file that you need to go and get to someone to you know so Pros and cons. Yeah, I think video is really, really important for property developers. I think increasingly as a society, we're moving to video as the sort of channel of choice. Mm. And I think you need to be producing video, showing off what you're doing, what you're producing. Uh, And I think people like to see that. Yep. Prospects particularly like to see things. And it doesn't have to be. I think that, you know, again, one of the blockages to people listening to this is going, oh, yeah, but it has to be really good and... I think there are parts, if you have a video marketing strategy, there will be component parts that should have very high production values. I'm guessing, and again, you you don't have a develop. you are, right now you have a dream, but maybe high production value would be you and your architect, developer and architect, sitting in a really nice location, talking about the dream. Yeah. And that's your kind of flagship video that you are going to use to get people to lean in and want to know more. But then there's the videos that I reckon you would do on site in the development where you go down with your iPhone, rain, hail or shine, don't care how the hair's looking or whether you've got lippy on your teeth, where you just go, g'day guys, I'm down on, on site. As you can see, the frames have gone up and it's pretty exciting and here we go. And raw, dirty, fine. It's an update. People are show, you're showing you care. Yeah, well, you're an old marketing guy. You would know that the videos that you can shoot and produce on your iPhones these days, 10 or 15 years ago, would have cost 10 to 20,000 bucks. Amazing. That's <laughs> ace. You know, like, that's where I go, you know, 
My overall view is the marketing world's changed so much in the past few years and all these changes are playing into the hands of you and I, the small business owner, and we're able to produce this stuff that, as you say, either we couldn't have done or we would have had to have found a whole lot of dough that we didn't have. And so let's talk about how people can find help then because most people out there are not going to be able to do all the things that we've just spoken about. Mm. Some might be able to do one or two. Yeah. What about getting help? How, how do you, well, how do you delegate or how do you find people to help you? Well, as a developer, you're already, you, you must, you have to be a great delegator, right? You mean you can't build, you can't interior design, you can't do your town planning. So you're already delegating all that stuff out. Uh, it should be the same with your marketing. Now, you can pick and choose. The problem with marketing is that people think they can all do it themselves. That's marketing. Yeah, let's get it. I'll get my, my, you know, my brother's nephew, my brother's nephew, which would also be my nephew. But, you know, oh, there's a family. Oh, Johnny, he does websites. <laughs> well, he's been in IT for years. He can do a website. Give me a break. The minute I hear IT, I go, you know, like, don't get him to do your website. Because, you know, the problem is there is the, you know, you and I could nail a bit of wood together but it's not going to be very well nailed. Well, certainly me, I'm making a judgment call about you or hammering Justin. But um, generally speaking, focus on your strengths, right? And so as you're delegating to your town planners and your architects, find that marketing person or agency. So the options are um, agency, if you can afford it, that's your expensive option, local agency, but it'll be all in-house and it'll be holistic and you'll have beautiful consistency across all aspects of your brand uh, through to um, identifying key personnel. Find a good web person. Find a good copywriter. Find a good person who's excellent at Facebook ads. Find a good video production person. If you do that, and I, I don't mind that option, but make sure they're all part of one team. And that I used to, I used to run the Yellow Pages, the Yellow Pages brand, a long time ago when it was a very, it was a twenty million dollar advertising account, go go mobile days, you know those famous old ads, and and as the person who was responsible for that business, we had a Yellow Pages had a public relations agency, um, they had a media agency, they had an advertising agency. They had all these different agencies, and I would every Monday morning, the first thing I would do is bring everyone together. So what are you doing? What's the PR agency doing? How can the video guys help you with that? Right, media, where have you, what are you booked? Stuff on Channel 9, cool. Do we need a spokesperson? So everyone spoke and was singing from the same songbook. And that was really powerful. Because if I didn't do that, then there's people doing disparate things all around the place to different ends. So there's a bit of work there. I know people are listening going, geez, it sounds bloody complicated. It's not that complicated. It seems fairly... Uh, Obvious to me. And what about emerging trends? You seeing anything no, new coming no. along? They're all bright, shiny objects. You know, they really are. Uh, you know, Periscope came up a few years ago. Oh, live streaming on Twitter. You know, it's still there. It's not. It hasn't changed the world. Um, you know, uh, no, no. I will always look out for emerging trends, um, but. The fundamentals of marketing, what we've spoken about, know who you're selling to, know the problems they're having, the questions they have, what are their fears, knowing that you need to build a brand around emotion, know that you should have good calls to action so it's easy for people to find you. <laughs> this is a fundamental, it's like a fundamental of buildings, you know, you need a foundation, you need a structure so you can hang pretty stuff on it. I don't think these things will ever change. And the minute we get distracted by a bright, shiny object is kind of the minute things fall to pieces. Yeah, I think you used to describe those, uh, uh, your prospects or buyers as your best mates. Yes. And I still try and think about potential buyers yeah. in that frame. It's like, my best well, mates, well, what, what would they want to know? That's right. What can we, how can we help them? But that's a great way of personalising it. That came from the fact that my favourite definition of marketing is it's what you do when you can't go and see someone. Because in an ideal world, we'd go out, you and I get up off our chairs now, and we just go and visit people, all those different individuals all around the place that have the potential to buy from us. Sit them down, have a drink, talk to them, at some point maybe do business with them, but time doesn't allow us to do that. So you've got to create marketing that makes them feel as though you were having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. And to do that, 
them needs to be identified as best mates. And then you can go and create copy and videos and podcasts and whatever it is that will make them feel as though they are being listened to and that you understand them. And that's, yeah. So I have a best mate in my business that I call him Daz. And Daz is very front and center as to someone who every time I create a piece of marketing, I do, every time I do a keynote at a conference or do an interview, I can feel Daz as being the person that I'm representing. Yeah, I think that's a really easy and good way of channeling your efforts. Yeah. Trying to make sure you're helping that person out. Totally. If you think about that before you go and make something, it'll either stop you from doing it or it'll help you make sure it's focused and yeah. it's going to solve a problem. Because the opposite of that, and, you can, and a business can have more than one best mate, more than one group of people they're selling to. But the opposite of that is... Uh, shotgun approach, scattergun approach, where you try to be everything to everyone and you end up being nothing to no one. And I, a lot of businesses do it, throw some mud against the wall, pray like hell that it sticks, uh, and often it, a lot doesn't. So I think there's courage in identifying key groups of people to sell to, but there's that notion of that group of people will be an inch wide, but they'll be a mile deep, and you can really mine that for the buyers. And so if there was one single tip... Hot you, cinnamon donuts, brother. Yeah. Hot apart, cinnamon donuts. Apart from the food. Put them out. <laughs> put them out at your opens. Put them out at your cocktail parties. It'll just trigger a whole lot of great memories. Uh, that's, uh, a, that's a symbolic cinnamon yes, donut is. you're talking about, isn't uh, it? Look, I'm just going to say respect marketing. Have, have more... In, in, increase your respect for marketing. Because I'm going to guess that there's a lot of people listening who make it an afterthought or who look at it as a pain or who avoid it at all costs because it just feels complicated. So I just think change your tune on that uh, for your next development or your current development. Um, put marketing fr- as, fr- as front and centre as you do your, your master builder or your town planner. Yeah, and I, just adding to that, I think a little bit of personality or emotion along with yeah. that would be is helpful no doubt just so it's not stodgy no no absolutely it'll be a point of difference in a crowded marketplace where there's no shortage of developments the personality that you inject into your copy in the way you deal with clients in your voicemail greeting will be a point of difference it will yeah and you might get different reactions to that because i remember doing a facebook post when we were selling some of our properties on the last project and it was about the same time as um what was that movie? The Mr. Grey movie? Grey... Grey... I don't know. No, the semi-porn thing. Here we go. <laughs> Grey. But all the women were, re- were reading the books. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> Fifty Shades of Grey had just come out at the time. Right. <laughs> I wrote this so Facebook yeah, okay. post. Great. Sort of tying into that. Yeah. How'd that and, go down? Um, Got a couple of people writing that they thought it was a ridiculous way right. to be trying to sell a property. Good on them. Which I didn't mind. So no. I'm just trying something different. But there'd be many who would, many developers who would freak out about that. Oh, gosh, I don't want people... It wasn't pornographic, Tim. No, it was S- just, sound like uh, Justin. Don't <laughs> backpack metal now. In fact, I think you've got a book in you which would be 50 Sheds of Grey, more to the point. But um, I think uh, that idea of marketing, not, not actively trying to get people's backs up, but at least trying to extract an opinion or a comment or some feedback, great. Just standing out, I think. Yeah. Putting a little bit of personality in, I don't think it hurts. But just be prepared <laughs> that sure. you're not going to cop a bit of flack yeah, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And when you cop the flack, remember that um, that was one out of 100. So you've got 99 people who were pretty damn happy with what you did. It's just that you know, the minority always gets heard. All right, well, let's switch gears a little bit now. So some more businessy kind of wow. questions. Yeah, okay. What's the toughest business decision you've ever had to make? Uh, the toughest business decision? I don't know. Uh, maybe going solo nine years ago, but I was so ready. Um, yeah, I don't feel like there's been so many... I'm one of those blokes who flies a little bit by the seat of his pants. Um, you know, I have colleagues who are very qualitative and need numbers and proof that what they're about to embark on is the right thing to do. So I'd be a hopeless developer. Uh, whereas I, I have a gut feel that I try to act on and it's been pretty accurate 
you know, I'm a, I'm a bit spiritual in that sense where I just trust and try and listen to what the universe is telling me. And if I can find the courage to act on it, it's generally been pretty good. And when I don't act on it, you know, and things remain the same, then it's not as good. So I'm pretty happy with the decisions I've made so far. All right, good. And now if you could sit down for dinner with any three people, alive or dead, <laughs> who would they be and why? The obvious answer is, you know, you know, buddy, what's his name and what's his name and what's his name. But um, I had a, a really interesting, I'm not into vision statements and mission statements, so I'm going to answer this question a little bit differently. Um, I had an interesting session with a mate of mine who is a coach of very high-performing athletes. And we were just doing some work on me a few months ago. And what As a, in an athlete? Capacity, you, know, <laughs> in you tell me, hey? You tell me. Uh, it doesn't help that this is audio, but um, no, no, it could have been a shot putter. Uh, but what we where we got to? We're just trying to figure out, you know, what what he he talk, he uses the word vision. Anyway, we agreed that my vision was to have. Um, to experience meaningful conversations, yeah? Because he was telling me about Walt Disney's vision, which was to make the world a happy place. And everything Walt Disney did was 100%. Kept on coming back. Whatever it was, it was the next theme park, the next ride, the next cartoon, the next book, it was to make the world a happy place. And I go, that, I get that. That worked. He's, he's nailed that. He's stuck to his guns. And look at the success he's had. My vision is to have meaningful, is to experience meaningful conversations. And... Um, so as long as I'm sitting around a table with people who want to have a good old chin wag, and I don't mean deep in D&Ms like we used to, you know, with the girls after school, you know, where they get all heavy and you just go, oh, I just want to go, you know, muck around my mates. Um, I just mean to have a good old chin wag, to have a good conversation. So whoever's around that table, put in, have a laugh, challenge what's being said, and away we go, you know. It doesn't have to be Mandela and Pope John Paul III and... Um, and, you know, the next Playboy Playmate. Well, that'd be pretty good. That'd be pretty good. <laughs> See, your mind's starting to take <laughs> over now. Right. <laughs> Was it 50, sh- 50 Shades or 50 Shades? <laughs> all right, Tim. Well, thanks very much for sharing all that with us today. Where can people find out more about you if they are interested? But they can go to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com and they'll find me and my podcasts. Uh, you know, subscribe to the podcast. You've subscribed to this one, I hope. Subscribe to mine and make time, 30 minutes a day, to consume some good quality business or marketing information to put you in the right frame of mind. Yeah, I'd encourage people to subscribe to Tim's podcast. It's very, very good. As I said, it inspired me to get this podcast off the ground. I'm sure each week that you do it, you'll get at least one idea that you could implement to help grow your business. I would hope so. Tim Reid, thanks so much for being on the Property Developer Podcast. Insert crowd roar. (laughs) We'll speak to you soon. All right, there you go. I hope you enjoyed that discussion with Tim. I think great marketing is one way that you can help your project stand out in a crowded marketplace. And this will lead to your stock being in demand, which will in turn help your business grow. Here are three lessons I took out of my conversation with Tim. One, make marketing your hobby. Tim mentioned how the successful business owners he has interviewed on his show have all taken a keen interest in marketing their businesses. They all committed regular time to marketing and found ways to make it fun and enjoyable. And let's face it, it should be fun to promote what your business is good at. If you can dedicate just 30 minutes a day to your marketing, you might be surprised what results it will yield if you do it consistently over a year or two. So get cracking. Two, be helpful in your marketing. In Tim's book, The Boomerang Effect, he outlines how you know so much about your industry and the products or services you sell. So you should share that knowledge openly and freely and build a tribe of long-term loyal customers. Become a helpful problem solver, not a pushy marketer, and you will see your marketing investment multiply exponentially. Start thinking about the questions buyers may have and set about answering them on your website. Three, use stories and emotions to create a connection. I know I keep banging on about stories and emotion, but it works and it's powerful, so use them. 
Okay, if you enjoyed that chat about marketing, then check out episode 8 with marketer Ben Buxton, who I mentioned in the discussion with Tim, if you want to learn how to sell out your next development project. Or try episode 24 with selling agent David Stewart about how you can stand out in a crowded marketplace. You can also find all the past episodes of the show at www.propertydeveloperpodcast.com and you can see all my latest property development photos and videos on Instagram at Property Developer Podcast. So, until next time, may all your marketing be helpful and emotional. You've been listening to the Property Developer Podcast. Tune in next time for more tips, ideas and inspiration to take your developing to the next level. For more developing love, make sure to visit propertydeveloperpodcast.com. 